right. It looks like it's about 1232. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of the U.S. Embassy to Barbados, the Eastern Caribbean, and the OECS, I'm delighted to welcome you each here today to the SRC virtual lunchtime chat. I'm Caitlin Moran, Public Diplomacy Associate at the U.S. Embassy in Bridgetown. In today's session, you will hear from two speakers who have deep insights on the discussion topic today, strengthening CARICOM U.S. relations through trade and investment. The Caribbean and the United States share many deep connections. One of these connections is our shared vision of vibrant economies strengthened by trade and investment. The U.S. Embassy is pleased to collaborate with the SRC on today's lunchtime chat and with each of you to discuss how to enrich these ties, how to face challenges and embrace the opportunities for advancing and revitalizing government and business relations between the Caribbean and the United States. I wanna thank the University of the West Indies, SRC, for the opportunity and Dr. Remy to collaborate and thank each of you for your participation in today's discussion. Welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to turn your attention to today's moderator, SRC Deputy Director, Dr. Janine Fez Remy. Dr. Remy. Thank you so very much, Caitlin. And it's always a pleasure to collaborate with important institutions and embassies such as the United States. Um, and so thank you very much for agreeing to co-host this very important event today um, on strengthening Car Caribbean CARICOM U.S. relations in the areas of investment and trade. My name is Dr. Jani Remy, and I am the Deputy Director at the Sridhar Ramphal Center. And I'm very pleased today to be co-hosting co on this very important topic. While the United States remains among CARICOM's most important international import and export markets, as well as an investor, the Caribbean is not high seemingly on the United States trade negotiating or investment list. Outside of the World Trade Organization, the only formal trade arrangements between the United States and CARICOM are non-reciprocal in nature, the Caribbean-based initiative, which was recently reauthorized, and the generalized system of preferences. Although there is a trade and investment framework agreement, the TIFA, in force, it has not been utilized very much. So despite the lackluster trade and investment relations to date, the region remains an important entity to the United States, not least because of its geographical placement and the growing influence of China. With the new Biden administration, I would say there's an opportunity to re-engage with the United States and forge a more meaningful and reinvigorated economic relationship. And that, my dear viewers, is our jump off point today. To think creatively of how in this possible moment of change and opportunity, we can engage and strengthen our trade and investment relationships with the new administration, thinking about the important events we have right now, such as COVID, pivoting now to meet our blue and green economy needs, and really bringing in the private sector in this new engagement with the United States. With me today to explore these wonderful issues of US Caribbean engagement are two very seasoned veterans on the area of U.S. CARICOM relationships. First of all, let me welcome Dr. David Lewis, who is an international trade consultant with 30 years experience in economic policy and business development in the Caribbean and Latin America, public and private sectors and international organizations. His area of expertise covers trade and investment promotion and development international business services and manufacturing sectors, and renewable fuels. Since 20, 2000, excuse me, he has been the vice president of Manchester Trade Limited, an international trade and business advisory firm operating out of Washington, DC. Mr. Lewis is also co-director and fellow of the newly launched Caribbean Policy Consortium, the CPC, a Washington Caribbean Research and Policy Network, of which I am also happy to be a fellow. So Mr. Lewis will be our main discussant, our main presenter today, but he will be followed by Ms. Felicia Prasad, who we are also very happy to welcome. She's Caribbean-born founder and CEO of Invest Caribbean, 
a US-based global private sector investment agency of the Caribbean. She lobbies for Caribbean investments and serves as a conduit between developers, investors, and governments. She's also a Caribbean American media personality and advocate and owns a daily syndicated newswire, News America's News Network and Caribbean PR Wire, the PR Wire of the Caribbean. So without further ado, let me welcome my two very distinguished panelists and ask and turn the floor over now to Mr. Lewis, who's gonna start with talking about the opportunities for this strengthened relationship between CARICOM and the United States in the area of trade and investment. Over to you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Janeve. Uh, good morning, colleagues and friends. Uh, Caitlin Moran with the US Embassy in Bridgetown. Uh, Janeve with the Ramphal Center at UWE Cave Hill. I wish I was there at Cave Hill, not in Washington today. And Felicia Poussard with Invest Caribbean. Great to be with you all. I'd like to congrat the embassy and the UWE organizers for this timely session, particularly because the, Biden the new Biden administration has just put in together its trade team and sharing its agenda and focus. The nominee for the US trade representative, Ms. Catherine Tai, just had her hearing in the Senate Finance Committee uh, just yesterday. And so we should be getting uh, that team in place very soon. Likewise, uh, double whammy, the CARICOM Heads of Government Summit uh, started taking place uh, yesterday uh, as we speak. And tomorrow, uh, the chairman, the Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, will also be given a briefing update virtually with our partner think tank here in Washington, the Atlantic Council. So I suspect that come spring and the warmer weather in Washington, we'll have our work cut out for us as to the U.S. CARICOM trade and investment agenda. Uh, we had a sort of uh, preview of three issues, and I'd just like to lay those out for the audience as I go into my presentation. Three issues or questions. One on how the economic and trade relationship between the U.S. and the region would be redefined by the major two events of 2020, the negative impact of COVID-19 and the election of President Joe Biden. And I think it's clear that we're really looking at economic recovery and reconstruction more than anything else. And for the CARICOM countries, really, the uh, services diversification with travel, entertainment, and hospitality at the center of that. So one of the key issues is going to be the regional capacities to really pick up uh, from pre-COVID years. Uh, secondly, what are the immediate opportunities and challenges for that trade and investment relationship? And I believe it's really one about trade and investment transactionalism. Uh, there are policy and business mechanisms I will discuss dating from almost 40 years ago with the Caribbean Basin Initiative. And as Janiv mentioned, the existing Trade and Investment Council under the Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, the TIC and the TIFA. Uh, but I think the business transactional focus needs to dominate. And obviously there's gonna be great emphasis with the administration and what's going on in the region on the use of new technologies to transform ec economics and also the environmental climate change revolution which is taking place. And third and foremost, really in my view, uh, what role does the Caribbean diaspora play in strengthening that relationship? And clearly there's unused human resource talent, engagement, entrepreneurship, and really uh, opportunities to use that in terms of the technology and digitalization gap and uh, what Felicia does very well, which is what we call citizen lobby and engagement and mobilization with the US government and with the Congress. So those are sort of the three guidelines we were given. I'd like to start out first with a quick uh, calendar timeline mapping, if you will, of the past 40 years. And I'll be quick on that. I won't go into a lot of detail, but really from 1984 to 2021, starting with the Caribbean Basin Economic Recovery Act of 1984, what we call the CBI, the Caribbean Basin Initiative with the Reagan administration, providing the region with the best US trade preferences in the world, later to be copied by the Andean region with their Andean Trade Development Trade and Promotion Act in 1991, and even the new Africa trade preferences, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act of 2000, which is now permanent law in the US. And I think it's important to point out that 
uh, under the CBI, we really went beyond the initial Reagan Cold War security agenda in the region, seeking to counter the communist threats in Jamaica, Grenada, Nicaragua, and the armed conflicts in Central America, particularly El Salvador and Guatemala. It really built on what was the post-Carter administration agenda of democratization and stabilization. And with that, the Caribbean became the focus, the first focus really in the US of the investment production and export centered economic development program called offshoring then, today you've heard of it as nearshoring. And the main focus was really jobs, 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 and the importance of private sector led de economic development in the region. Move forward to 1989, and we have the launch of the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, the CSME, the Grand Ants Declaration, 32 years in the making and still incomplete in terms of forging the domestic trade and investment economic integration regime, which regulates the domestic, intra-regional and extra-regional foreign trade regime of the region. Critical to understand, if that domestic regime is not in sync as a common market, then there's a major deficit domestically, regionally, and externally to engage trade and investment partners. And this remains a key challenge for CARICOM. By 1991, the UN Economic Commission on Latin America was already stating in their assessment of economic integration groups in the Americas that the CARICOM regime was the most advanced and comprehensive economic integration scheme in the Americas at that point in time. And that was critical to note because as we moved forward into the uh, end of the 20th century, other groupings in the region began to pick up on that. In 1991, we have the launching of the US CARICOM Trade and Investment Council negotiations, which would eventually reach the Trade and Investment Framework Agreement. And for those of you uh, who don't know, the TIC is usually a precursor and a stepping stone to a free trade agreement between the US and the counterpart countries. Back in history in 1992, the short-lived uh, Enterprise of the Americas initiative was launched by the Bush administration. And then the Clinton administration launched the Summit of the Americas initiative and the Free Trade Area of the Americas, the FTAA. As many of you know, the summit process continues and the next summit should be this fall in the United States. The FTAA process unfortunately was delayed was derailed at the Miami Ministerial of 2003, where Brazil and Mercosur opposed many of the plans for a hemispheric-wide free trade agreement. And to a great degree, CARICOM countries abstained, arguing for more time to adjust, therefore leading to no hemispheric consensus and a stopping of that. By 1994, we had the North American Free Trade Agreement between the US, Canada, and Mexico, and the Caribbean region, the CBI beneficiaries of the Caribbean and Central America, begin to ask for what we call at that point, NAFTA parity. And in 1999-2000, with the end of the century, we have the multi-fiber agreement in the WTO, the entry of China in the uh, WTO, and the end of the multi-fiber agreement, which regulated textile exports across the world and began the major challenge to offshore manufacturing in textile and apparel for this region. As we moved into the 21st centuries, we had various improvements and extensions of the CBI. In 2000, with what we call the NAFTA parity, and then the FTA clause establishing that the CBI would be made permanent into 2020, unless a country or a group of countries negotiate a free trade agreement with the US. Important to note that for Haiti, a special set aside was established, which is the HOPE Act, the Haitian Hemispheric Opportunity Through Partnership Encouragement Act in 2006, and then in 2008, and in the CBI renewal of 2020 last year, it was made permanent. And this allowed for the joint venture and co-production rules of origin in textile and apparel for Haiti with the Dominican Republic under what would be coming forth as the Central America, US, Dominican Republic free trade agreement of 2006. And this has been for the past decade, the major export and job success initiative for Haiti 
under the CBI and the HOPE program. So as a result of the CBI, we have that the region was uh, offered the best trade and investment agreement in terms of establishing in a regional value chain of competitiveness in manufacturing sectors such as textile apparel, the free trade zone phenomena, light manufacturing and electronics, medical devices and logistics with major US firms in investing in the region. What we call today the global value chain and supply chain uh, as the new reshoring and new shoring agendas from China today. That began to happen in the region as early as the CBI. With the CAFTA DR in the middle of the 2000s by 2006, CARICOM is left alone as the only beneficiary of the CBI and in severe competitive disadvantage because the rest of the CBI beneficiaries now had full-fledged free trade agreements with the United States. By 2010, we no longer had free trade zones for export in the CARICOM markets with the exception of Haiti. The last plant uh, closed in Jamaica in 2010. That was a, a hosiery manufacturer of uh, jockey. And with the failure of the FTA negotiations, we basically are faced with the end of preferences as factors for export competitiveness for the CARICOM countries. And faced with the situation of being less competitive vis-a-vis -vis FTA partners in the hemisphere. At the same time, and I think this is really critical in terms of next steps, we had a regional economic transformation in CARICOM markets from a goods manufacturing economy predominantly to a services transformation economy. And that I think has major implications because the CBI and the renewal of 2020 remains a goods-based agreement and does not include services per se, the way that free trade agreements does. By 2013, we finally signed the Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, the TIFA, which had started in the tick of 1991. So that took quite a long time. And uh, uh, that ironically was signed by the then Vice President and now President Joe Biden. In those years, we've had eight meetings of the US CARICOM uh, tick, and the last one was in June 2019. During the, peer, the last four years, we also had the initiative of the US Caribbean Strategic Engagement Act and strategy with congressional legislation and led by the State Department, covering a work plan across 20 plus pillars of economic development, governance, security, way beyond the trade and investment agenda. But I think it's important because it gives us a framework in terms of what US government agenda uh, developments are uh, terms of all of government, but also including bipartisan support at the level of Congress. <clears throat> and then of course, we have last year's renewal, extension and permanence of the CBTPA CBI in a region that is no longer <clears throat> a goods producer and exporter, is dominated by services and really faces us with a, what I call the major conundrum as the economic development of policy tools in the region were all centered on goods and not services. Is there a nearshoring phenomena that can take place for, in services for the region? That's something to investigate because the region still remains attractive and competitive in terms of closeness to the US and being de facto integrated into the US economy, which does remain the largest producer, consumer, and investor market in the world. In addition to that, and at the end of the Trump administration, we have the launching and the transformation of all US uh, foreign development assistance models la launched into the US International Development Finance Corporation. And quickly last year, we had investment MOUs signed with Suriname, Guyana, Jamaica, and Haiti. And it's to be determined what the Biden administration will be doing in terms of this. And this in parallel with a new focus of the Inter-American Development Bank on Caribbean and small economies. <clears throat> with the new administration in Washington under President Joe Biden, we also have the phenomenon of many of the same policy leaders in, of previous administrations in place having worked on these Caribbean agendas. So we have a real question, is change needed or do we continue with what has relatively been a decades-long successful framework 
uh, but many could argue is not good enough. Is there a need for a transformation, for a change, for an upgrading? Two recent commentators by, commentaries by colleagues of ours have drawn this to the attention. David Jessup with the Caribbean Council for Europe in London this past February, just this month earlier, mentioned a new US initiative for the Caribbean is needed to spur a post-pandemic Marshall Plan type economic recovery to see if we can reach the levels, pre-COVID levels by 2023, 2025. And he argues a need for governmental and multilateral institutions and the private sector catalyst, similar to what took place in the 1980s uh, and at the private sector level with organizations like the Caribbean Central American Action, the Caribbean Association of Industry and Commerce. But one of the comments we need to make is that it's a new private sector and economy in the US and the region today. In the region, much more inward looking and sector issue specific, no longer having to challenge the, and lead the fights for private sector development and really less focused on the extra regional items and much more focused on that domestic pending agenda of the CSME, which I mentioned. One key example was in the 2019 US International Trade Commission hearings on the annual reports of US CBI trade, where we had 24 submissions from the region. All were governments except for four. And of those four, one was the Haitian Manufacturers Association, two were US multinational apparel companies invested in Haiti, and one was by the St. Kitts Manufacturers Group, which still exports light manufacturing and electronics into the US under the benefits of the CBI. When we canvass many CARICOM companies as to not engage in, with the ITC on this, over and over, the response was, oh, the Ministry of Trade is handling that for us. So there's an important issue with regards to, on the one hand, the importance of government private sector collaboration, but on the other hand, ministries and government do not invest, do not produce and do not trade. So there's a major challenge in terms of private sector engagement with uh, the policy and economic transactional initiatives. Daniel Rundy of the Center for Strategic of International Studies here in Washington in December also presented an initiative to call a new CBI. This one though, to counter Chinese inroads in the region, a la Reagan initiatives in the 1980s against Soviet communist in expansion. And with a geostrategic and geoeconomic focus for economic rebuilding and safeguarding the US-Caribbean alliance. Obviously under the new Biden administration, there'll be new opportunities. We have a solid bipartisan support in terms of the US CARICOM trade agenda and their initiatives at the civil society private sector level. But it begs the question, can we not use the existing tools and just implement and execute them better and make them effective for the 21st centuries? And I think in that sense, there are factors and variables which we need to look at, which really matter to make this possible or not. The need to focus on foreign direct investment, production and trade, the US demand for these goods and regional supply side support, the bipartisan support where all presidents have favored and supported all these Caribbean basin initiatives for CARICOM from Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush W, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and we expect the Biden administration too. And the same in Congress. The US business and market presence remains predominant in the region, despite challenges from China, which have really focused more on investment in projects in the region. But the trade agenda is still very weak with China when you compare with the United States. And then of course, you do have CARICOM business changes themselves where businesses and enterprises and conglomerates are much more inward looking into the domestic market and challenging the problems and the obstacles of an incomplete domestic trade, investment and business regime of the CMS, CSME since 1989. And then of course we have the new force and factor of the diaspora as economic actors. And the best example of that recently is really 
the growth in Guyana of the diaspora influence beyond oil and Exxon into many other areas. <clears throat> if we add to that the new role of multilaterals like the IDB, the new DFC, and the challenge of accessing capital and financing, focusing on SMEs, it really begs the question, can we not use the tools that we have now to leverage in these new areas? The technology and digitalization agenda for the region is critical. Although the recent Price Waterhouse Coopers Caribbean Digital Readiness Survey of 2021 indicates that only 50% of the firms in the region indicate they are ready. And of course, we have the main structural challenge of 2021 in terms of the post pandemia recovery and reconstruction. Hopefully, as many indicators are pointing, that by 2023, or maybe even 25, we will have that point. The catalyst of that success over these decades has been the driver-led agenda as per the CBI. The missing link we believe today is not waiting for Washington to decide and propose to the region as a passive audience, but really to see where are the drivers in the region who can lead and who can lead, lead and who can lead a new initiative in terms of leveraging what we have, the tools and the skills. So the question really, do we need the new institution, new policies, mechanisms or institutionalities, or can we use what we have? So in terms of that, the Trade and Investment Council and Artifa with the US. The results of these four decades are actually quite successful if you look at the volume uh, the region has had unrestricted unilateral trade preferences in the U.S. market and U.S. exports have developed manufacturing for export capabilities and export value chains across the region, building a robust trade and investment relationship, which grew from a meager total balance of $2 billion in 1996 to close to $22 billion in 2019. However, Regional tra economic transformations into services, mostly tourism, but also financial, telecommunications, health, and educational sectors have resulted in a limited and weak manufacturing competitiveness and a major trade imbalance of two to one proportion, whereby 2019 US exports to the region totaled $15 billion, while regional exports to the US were 7 billion. U.S. FDI totals in that same period have also grown from about 1 billion in 1991 to close to 4 billion in 2019. These asymmetries and imbalances reflect a major economic structural weakness in the region, masked by what I call the paradoxical success of large flows of trade and investment and reflecting severe economic asymmetries and imbalances at the policy and business levels. This conundrum is at the center of a need to focus policy and business resources on the options for a more balanced economic strategic repositioning of the region vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., offering new opportunities in the trade and investment space. With regards to the TIC since 1991 and the TIFA in 2013 to close off, I think there's an agenda that can be activated, particularly in terms of trade facilitation, trade capacity building, innovation, new technologies, and the engagement of the private sector, as have done other country and regional TICs and TIFAs successfully over the decades. Our best example is another small country, small region, TIC, which was established in 2018 between the US and Uruguay, which has a population of 3.5 million people. And over the years, by 2014, Leveraging the TIC became the Southern Cone hub for U.S. and international high-tech and services industries in information communication technologies, e-commerce, logistics, and software development, with the first services free trade zone in the Americas established in Uruguay, attracting companies like Google, Amazon, Apple, and logistics and shipping firms like UPS, FedEx, and DHL. By 2014, the results were in where trade growth with the US had grown five times, totaling $2.2 billion, US exports of 1.8 billion and Uruguay exports to the US of 400 million. And FDI had doubled 
to 2 billion. So over the years, this has been very successful. And we call it the economic growth benefits of an FTA without the political cost. Both countries have centered on a mutuality of interest, selecting discrete, tangible transactional initiatives. And there's no reason the US CARICOM tick cannot do the same. The major challenge, in our opinion, is there has been a business absence in the meetings of the TIC between the region and therefore limiting the trade and investment transformative initiatives which could take place. Who invests, who produces, and who trades, when, where, and how. In the US, trade and investment agenda is legislated and mandates by law consultation and participation not only by the private sector but by civil society. In the case of CARICOM, this is not the same. And it's a major challenge to maximize benefits and opportunities from the ticks, not only for the private sector, but also civil society as a whole, labor, academia, research institutions, what we call the organic actors of trade and investment policy. This week's Heads of Government Summit would have had the annual tripartite briefing session for labor, business, and civil society all together. We believe that something needs to be developed where at the CARICOM level, the focus really is to bring the private sector into this trade and investment council discussion with the US in order to be able to uh, focus on the transactional business and investment initiatives, which can be leveraged and have been done so as the case of the Uruguay, TIC, and TIFA to really focus on new initiatives in trade and investment, focusing away from the manufactured sector, which has been the tradition of CBI, and into the new services economy of the region. I will stop there, and we can have more details in the discussion period. Thank you all. Thank you so much, David, for that, I would say, comprehensive, historical, future-oriented um, approach towards U.S. CARICOM relations. I mean, you started very much like wedded in and, and steeped in the history of our relationship, um, brought us all the way up to current um, formal relationships. And then you proposed some really, you know, I would say um, very, very useful um, solutions to how we can really begin um, engaging, whether it's through the TIC or through reconceptualizing um, the CBI to include services. So a lot of food for thought at, at that level of policy and government action, as well as the private sector. And you ha you've generated quite a few questions, well, a few, and I'd encourage persons to, to reflect their comments as well as their questions in the Q&A box. But before we get to the questions, I would like to turn the floor or the mic over to Felicia Prasad, who um, I'm sure is going to provide um, a perspective from the diaspora, thinking concretely from the bottom up about how we can improve these relationships starting and thinking about engaging the private sector, whether it's in the region or outside of it, and really animating um, all of these different uh, perspectives um, and various stakeholders and how we can improve these relationships. So uh, Felicia, over to you to, to provide your remarks on David's presentations, as well as provide your own on how we can strengthen these US CARICOM relations. Your mic is off. Thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, David, for that very detailed historic uh, overview and presentation. I also want to thank, of course, the US Embassy for making this happen in UWE Cape Hill campus in Barbados. But I want to take this opportunity just for a brief moment to also wish everyone who is logging in happy Black History Month because we're still in Black History Month. And today's actually a very historic day. It's February 25th. And in 1870, the US had its first black senator. So we're standing on the shoulders of many that date back to the 1870s. And I just wanna take this moment to also recognize Senator Hiram Revels, uh, who was the first US black senator here before I get to my discussion, which is going to go a little different route from, from David's very formal presentation. I just want to talk basically more as a Caribbean diaspora entrepreneur here in the US, but who's also focused on the Caribbean. And I'm not sure if there are many 
uh, US entrepreneurs or Caribbean entrepreneurs and small business owners joining us that they may be able to sort of relate and take, uh, take away something from what I'm sharing, a very vulnerable personal experience as, to, as it relates to the challenges to trade and investment uh, in the Caribbean that I've experienced. But first, let's do a little time travel. It's 2010, it's been a few years before I've launched the first daily newswire for the Caribbean and also Caribbean Wire, which is the PR newswire of the Caribbean. I'm in St. Martin at a tourism conference with the Caribbean Tourism Organization. And I happened to be sitting at the same table with the director of the New York branch at the time uh, where I was living. And we got into a conversation. She was talking about Caribbean Week in New York, which was coming up the next year. And it was by then in about its 20th year or so. And so I asked her a very simple question. How is it that there is no investment component to this week that's been occurring for over two decades? After all, to me, tourism is not just about people coming to the destination for fun, but it's also about investment coming into each country in the region. And so without skipping a beat, she says to me, why don't you do it? So I thought for, about it for a moment and I said, well, I'm an entrepreneur, how hard can this be? I'll call up a few investment agencies, put together a breakfast panel, get them to network with the ministers of government, they do business, everybody wins, voila, it's a win-win situation. Well, was I in for a shock? In fact, it turned into one of those very stress pit moments of your life that you regret actually trying to do. But I get into it and I make it happen and it's a success. And suddenly everybody's asking about the next year and the next. And so we're finally launching. And that ladies and gentlemen is really the genesis of Invest Caribbean and how it came to be. But fast track that to 2015 and we're a couple years in and we're starting to get some complaints from people who are coming to our conferences that Caribbean government ministers are not as serious about doing business with them when they come to these conferences and they're more about the photo op. And so we decide we're going to move away from the conference circuit and take it to a more serious level where the need is, which is really about funding, where developers are coming to these conferences looking for funding so that they can actually build projects and invest in the Caribbean. And so we set ourselves up as the conduit between the funders and investors and developers. And we're going along working, making sure that funders actually are getting funded, but we're running into another major problem. And that is that US banks are actually blunt about saying they're really not lending into the Caribbean. So we're having to find private funders and go further afield globally, including to China, for funders, for our developers and the projects that they're presenting. So we're going along fast track to 2020 and it's January and we've just signed a major deal into Guyana and four other countries. We're feeling pretty good. And then it's March and the pandemic hits and suddenly every lender is shutting the door in our face. They're no longer lending into the Caribbean or internationally, in fact, Everybody is taking a watch and see approach. And so ladies and gentlemen, just like that, at the drop of a hat, the Caribbean again became absolutely negligible. And why is that? Because as I sit here on February 25th, 2021 at about noon Eastern time, the number one challenge to trade and investment in the Caribbean remains today access to capital. And that is something that we're finding whether you're a big developer, a small developer, a startup, an entrepreneur, or a medium to large enterprise. That is the number one problem that we're seeing, that we're hearing, and that we ourselves are dealing with. So how do we deal with this? How does the Biden administration and Caribbean governments look to the future to fix this problem? Well, today I'd like to point out 10 points that I've come up with to help make this happen. And I'm going to start by reading you the first point. Number one, that the US government, which to my knowledge has for too long ignored the Caribbean and the Americas and treated it like a stepchild, 
To me, the Biden administration should be creating a $100 million Caribbean Development Fund to invest in companies and ventures across this region, especially in this pandemic era where the region needs a jump start in the post pandemic era. And also, small businesses need the opportunity to access capital in order to create jobs and to grow in this region. But most of all, this fund, as I point out, should not be run just by a governmental institution, but by a private hedge fund working with investment companies in the Caribbean in order to actually get capital directly to the developers and lenders who are making it happen on the ground. Point two, that President Joe Biden gives this task of launching this venture to his Caribbean roots Vice President Kamala Harris, and who in turn can be liaisoning with Caribbean governments. Point number three, that the Biden administration co-hosts a conference on the future of the Caribbean and not just have the region lumped in to the wider summit of the Americas where it gets lost in with Latin America. Number four, that the US government fosters partnerships between major US companies and Caribbean companies. So products from the region can actually be able to make it into the US market without these small entrepreneurs and companies and manufacturers having to deal with the hassle of trade overheads and tariffs and costs that come with their operations and, and being able to access the CBI. Point number five, that President Joe Biden creates an assistant secretary of state for the Caribbean and not just for the Western hemisphere. Number six, that President Joe Biden not make just political appointments for ambassadors in the region, but choose ambassadors from people who are knowledgeable about this region and also from the Caribbean American diaspora. Point number seven, that governments of the Caribbean use this pandemic to actually hit the reset button and create a five to 10 year vision plan. And from that, we can move towards trade that's coming from the region and also investment that is coming into the region. And that I think is beyond tourism and just hotels. Number eight, that we create our own Silicon Valley, so to speak, with technical businesses, incubators, education, training, and easily accessible funding. I find many tech startups now are growing across the region, but again, the major problem that they're having in growing is how do they access capital? And I'm not talking just about in one country, I'm talking about across the region. How are they able to go to one place, one source, and access capital. And that is what we need to make happen. Number nine, that we create a system in the Caribbean diaspora where we actually map a database of key entrepreneurs, business owners, talented people who can actually help to not just grow the Caribbean, but be also a community here in the diaspora, like Israel has done with its diaspora. And we've seen the growth of that indeed. And that is what we need to do to engage the diaspora. And finally, number 10, that the Caribbean diaspora be engaged to invest in a diaspora bond, again, just as India and Israel has actually done. What can this fund be used for? Infrastructure and of course, any kind of crisis development that the region encounters. It, India, by the way, had tremendous success with issuing the India Development Bond, the resurgent India Bond, and the India Millennia Bond. And Israel, of course, has been doing these development bonds and reissuing them since 1951. How do we make this happen? Because the patriotic devotion of the Caribbean diaspora to the region is something that is tangible, that can actually be tapped into and used beyond just sending remittances back home. It creates a way for a mutual benefit where people can actually see a return on their investment and feel they're actually investing and benefiting from it. These are the keys that I feel in my short time should be where we're focusing on as we look at this topic and look to the future post pandemic in this Caribbean region. In closing also, I wanna just leave you with this thought as we look as, at this new vision plan 
for the region. Embracing a new perspective wouldn't be easy, but like a caterpillar's struggle to become a butterfly, the struggle will give strength to wings so that we can fly. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time the Caribbean not just flies, but soars. We have the human capital and the creativity to make it happen. Let's make it happen in 2021 beyond cheap talk and lots of trade deals. I thank you so much and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much for that. I think we were treated to two very different but extremely complimentary presentations. One from the perspective of somebody in the diaspora that has tangible ideas of how we can actually formalize our relations from, 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 from her experience working in business and investment. And the other one, um, I'm sure he also has experience working in business, but really thinking conceptually about how to improve the policy and the, uh, and the, the mechanisms for doing more, more trade and formal investment and negotiation with the US. So we have quite a few questions. Um, I wanted to reflect on some of them um, I, I won't be able to get to all, but I'm trying to, to kind of bridge them and bring them together. Um, one has actually been sent to me pri prior to this call, and it, it sort of is a question of how we unify the different voices of CARICOM into one and make sure that in any of these endeavors, the Caribbean is really speaking with one voice. And tied to that also is a question from Gerard Vergas who asked, how do we even reconcile the drive for trade between CARICOM and external entities like the United States, where we have a poor record of intra-CARICOM trade? Uh, so if either of you would like to tackle that question of how do we get our act together, either politically or economically, before we can engage with the United States and propose further strengthening of relations. So I'll, I'll give you that and then we can go back to some more questions, either David or Felicia. But I think um, one of the points I mentioned and the reason why I brought in the CSME <clears throat> is really that if a country or a group of countries do not have what we call an established domestic regime that regulates trade and investment and business with clear rules of the game and covering the entire spectrum of uh, free movement of labor, capital, services and goods, not only are you challenged with that national or in the case of a region domestic regime, which is what we've been seeing in CARICOM, but you are then hamstrung to engage other partners because that regime, <coughs> excuse me, is the foundation upon which external partners relate to you in terms of what are ma market access issues, what are investment issues and so on. And uh, overall, Internationally, what we see is that successful groups of countries that engage externally have at least 50% of their trade and investment domestically in their regional uh, situation. In the case of CARICOM, it has always hovered around the 20s and the 30%. And um, it's, it's, it's natural that someone like uh, Gervasi would ask this question because as I mentioned, what we've seen is that the challenge for regional companies has been, if we can't consolidate the domestic regime, the CSME, we are at a serious disadvantage to then go and talk to non-CARICOM trade partners, not only the largest economy in the world, but even to engage the Dominican Republic, which is only 11 million people. The region's businesses are hamstrung in that because they haven't been able to um, develop uh, the, the domestic trade regime and consolidate it. And that remains one of the key challenges, which um, I think at some point, uh, not only heads but of government, but businesses are going to have to leverage to be able to close that circle. And it limits the engagement then with third, third parties, in this case with the US, but it's happened with all, with the EU trade and investment regime and with others in Latin America as well. I, I guess if before I hand over to Felicia, the question would be one of our, as Alicia Nichols asked, well, what about the option of joining the CAFTA DR um, sort of arrangement? So in other words, to try to beef up intra-regional trade, sort of 
finding a way of, of triangulating that trade with others like the United States as a way of, of, of sort of fueling the regional trade as, you know, as a three-way kind of approach. Right. So I don't know if you had any comments on any of these or any, what I just mentioned, which is linking up with the CAF, the DR and engagement as a, a possible way forward for our region. Well, I saw, I saw the question on the FTA and I think that there was a time particularly um, after the end of the FTA in 2003 and that, that decade in the, uh, up to 2010 or so, that there was a big question and pressures and discussions in the region and the US, should not CARICOM since Central America and the DR have now graduated from CBI and have a better deal with uh, CAFTA DR, should not CARICOM engage that? And I think over the years with uh, severe structural limitations and also, uh, uh, political restraints in the region. I've come to the conclusion, and I think the example of Uruguay um, uh, really supports that, that some markets, some countries, some economies are just not made for full-fledged open trade and investment agreements with other larger economies. The asymmetries are just such that you, you, you just can't imagine setting that up. I think Central America are small economies, um, they're actually lower level of economic development than the U.S., but they have geographic contiguity, which now says that El Salvador is not a country of 10 million people. El Salvador is a location in Central America, which is a market of 40 million people with geographic continuity, which islands do not have. And that really is a big difference. And I think really that we need to explore how can you leverage like Uruguay did that had similar economy of scale and also political challenges to negotiate a free trade agreement because Uruguay is part of Mercosur. And if all the group doesn't negotiate, one cannot negotiate. Uruguay said, let me look at three discrete areas of the tick and the TIFA. And let me work on those with the US that today, when you look at the data, if you don't know that it's Uruguay, you would say, that is a country that has a free trade agreement with the United States without all the political baggage that a free trade agreement brings. There is no reason we cannot use the TIC and the TIFA to target three, four specific business sector initiatives and say, with the US, let's use the mechanism of the TIC and the TIFA to leverage business trade investment in these areas and make that grow for jobs in the region. We just need to do it. We just haven't done it, but it's been done before. Thank you, David. Uh, Felicia, I, I, don't, I think I gave you an opportunity to respond. I don't know if you, you had anything to say on, on that, these questions. I just wanted to add to what David said. Basically, I think we have to chew gum and walk at the same time. And that really is, is what has to be done. So we have to identify at least regional issues, at least two or three regional issues. And, and of course, that regional issue to me across board is access to capital wherever you're sitting uh, in any country. So if you can do that and engage the US government, especially this new administration, and come to the table with an actual problem and what you'd like to see happen, I think that is how you start the dialogue and make things happen. Well, we got from one of our audience members a request. She said that you that he said, Arthur Piccolo, <laughs> that you nailed it um, and that the Biden administration should make you uh, the special advisor for the Caribbean. So that's beautiful. <laughs> but I guess the question I would ask, and we only have five more minutes is, we came up with a lot of different suggestions for advancing these relations with the United States. What is the next step concretely? What, what is the next step that you would say Caribbean government should endorse in either approaching the United States or in, you know, either in terms of a, a specific deal or even a meeting, a conference? 